Chapter two, how the Pollywog finally escaped. Although the others tried to shoulder some of the blame for what happened that afternoon, Petty always blamed herself. She should have known better than to turn her back on the Pollywog, even for five minutes, she said. Well, Pamela would always say when they discussed it later, if you hadn't, it never would have happened. I know, Penny would answer, but that doesn't excuse it. Suppose they'd eaten him or something. Then how would we feel? Well, they didn't, Pamela would reply. And then they would start talking about other things, like the next meeting of the Alfred Laverne fan club, or whether Miss Leach, the grade five teacher, was in love with Mr. Bradley, the principal. On the afternoon that it happened, the Pollywog was in jail as usual, and as usual, he was trying to escape. For his entire life, which seemed to have been very long, but was actually only 12 months, he had been staring out at the world from behind bars. Here he is, in jail. First, there had been the crib in the hospital, into which they had plopped him after he was born, and then there was the crib at home. Sometimes they would take him out of the crib and pop him in the playpen. More bars. The polywog would grip the bars like a convict and stare out at the world. He would work out elaborate means of escape and sometimes he actually succeeded in escaping. Nobody ever knew how he did it. But the fact was that occasionally he would be discovered outside his playpen or his crib or down off the high chair, which was his third prison. When the polywog did escape, he began to crawl at a really unbelievable rate of speed, heading for the open country. Pamela always said he was trying to get across the Mexican border. He crawled at a rate of about six miles an hour, which meant that you had to run to catch him and when you caught him, he still tried to get away. On that memorable and hot afternoon, the polywog was imprisoned in his high chair, having a leisurely late lunch. The high chair had bars on it too, horizontal ones. Also, it had a strap which came up between the polywog's fat legs and further tethered him to the bars. The polywog's agile little brain was ticking like a dollar watch, working on a grand escape plan while he pretended innocently to eat his pablum and milk. As everyone knows, pablum is the finest food there is for babies. It is chock full of vitamins, rich in calories, jammed with nutriment. And it is so easy to prepare too. Yum, yum, man, oh man. Everybody knew this except the polywog. He liked gumdrops, steak, licorice cigarettes, and Dr. Klebe's pet food, but he could not stand pablum. It was his scheme to get out of the high chair, crawl to the kitchen cupboard, get the door open, and steal all the jelly beans, which he happened to know had been hidden inside. Then he would head for the Mexican border as fast as his forelegs would carry him. He knew the jelly beans were there because he had seen his mother put them there. Mothers sometimes act as if babies were blind, deaf, and dumb. They are anything but. They are a cunning lot, and this one was a master safe cracker with a brain as sharp as a cold chisel. Though pretending to eat the pablum, the polywog was really feeding it to the earless Osdick the black cat who sat directly beneath the high chair. Earless Osdick was the polywog's inseparable companion. Grown-ups used to say to each other, isn't it touching how the cat follows that child everywhere he goes? This simply proves they didn't know much about cats. The reason Earless Osdick followed the polywog everywhere and sat so faithfully beneath the high chair was because the polywog fed him constantly. Sometimes the polywog did it on purpose, and sometimes he did it because he wasn't very good at eating. He would miss with his spoon, and Earless Osdick would lap up the pablum as it fell. Earless Osdick loved pablum. 
He preferred it to Dr. Klebe's pet food. As for the polywog, he liked Earless Osdick to sit under the high chair because on those occasions when he did escape, he landed on him and the cat cushioned his fall. Earless Osdick did not know that he was a cat any more than the polywog knew that he was a baby. Both of them thought they were dogs and nobody had ever got around to telling them differently. When Earless Osdick was a kitten, he had been brought up with the dog, whose name was Yukon King. Yukon King was perhaps the smallest dog ever born, but he did not know that. He thought he was a Mastiff, or perhaps a Malamute, which is a Yukon sled dog. The children had called him Yukon King after the television dog in the Corporal Clancy of the Klondike series, and the name had made the dog feel big. When somebody called, here, Yukon King, the dog would dash across the field, feeling fierce and pretending that he was bounding over the frozen wastes on the trail of desperate criminals. Corporal Clancy was his favorite television program. It was difficult to drag him away from the set for meals if Corporal Clancy was showing. Yukon King would listen for his name and then try to bark in a deep, low voice. Actually, he had a high, shrill yip, but he never stopped practicing a deeper bark. Earless Osdick was called Earless Osdick because he kept his ears folded down like a dog and not sharply upright like a cat. This is because he slept with the dog, ate with the dog, and thought he was a dog. He and Yukon King tried barking daily without much success, but they still kept at it. Actually, the polywog was much better at barking than either Yukon King or Earless Osdick. He was so convincing that he had once terrified a strange tomcat who had come over to sniff at Earless Osdick. The cat's tail had grown three sizes too big for it, and the cat had rushed up a tree in fright. This confirmed the polywog in his belief that he was a dog. After all, he walked on four feet like a dog and was tied up or locked up like a dog. Sometimes when nobody was looking, he ate out of Yukon King's dish for he was very fond of Dr. Klebe's pet food. At the moment, the polywog was keeping his eye on mother. Sooner or later, he knew she would leave the kitchen on some errand and then he would put his grand plan into practice. The only snag in the scheme, as he saw it, was the presence of Peter in the living room. Peter would tell if he saw him, but perhaps Peter would not see him. Peter was absorbed in playing with his cars. Cars were Peter's life. He usually had one in each pocket and two in each hand. At the moment, he was lying on his back on the sofa, running one of the little cars up and down his leg and over the back of the sofa and making car noises with his mouth. Roar, went Peter. He was pretending that he was Mr. Whipple the garbage man driving a big garbage truck. Beep, beep, he went. He was pretending that he was in a crash with another car. Mr. Whipple was killed in the crash. Too bad. The telephone rang in the hall, and Mother left off wiping the dishes and went to answer it. The polywog moved like greased lightning. How he escaped from high chairs, playpens, and cribs was a secret he never revealed. But the fact is that Mother was no sooner out of the kitchen than plop. The polywog had landed on earless Osdick and was halfway toward the jelly beans. Rrrr, went Peter pushing a tiny little fire engine across his knee. Mr. Grimble's candy store was burning down, but he would put out the fire. Somewhere in the back of his mind, he heard a cupboard door open softly. He knew at once which door it was. It was the door of the cupboard where the jelly beans were kept. Peter was a mild little boy who seldom got into trouble. He lived in a world of his own, surrounded by cars, tractors, fire engines, and rocket ships. He could tell a Rambler from a Volkswagen, and he knew all about the Boeing 707. When he grew up, he intended to be a garbage man and take over Mr. Whipple's route when Mr. Whipple was killed in a crash, as he would certainly be. 
It would never occur to Peter to open a cupboard door and steal jelly beans or anything else. But when that particular cupboard door did open, he was always alert. There he is, driving his little cars over his knees. Look at stealing the jelly beans. He knew its sound as well as he knew his own voice. It was the goody cupboard, and when it opened, it sometimes meant that his mother was about to give him something sweet. Peter stuffed all the little cars into the pockets of his shorts except one, his favorite toy tractor, which he held in his fist. Then he rolled off the sofa and trod it out to the kitchen. There he caught the pollywog red-handed with both his forepaws in the jelly bean jar. The pollywog's mind was moving at high speed. He realized at once that if his plan was to succeed, the only answer was out and out bribery. In a single swift movement, he thrust a handful of jelly beans directly at Peter, who, without thinking, accepted them. Peter had never stolen anything in his life. It is true that he had occasionally borrowed little cars from his neighboring playmates, but that was different. They borrowed cars from him just as frequently, and no one really knew or cared who owned what. But if somebody gives you something, can it be called stealing? Peter thought not, though he was wrestling with his conscience. Certainly he was accepting stolen goods, as the police put it, and he knew it. Perhaps if the handful of jelly beans that the pollywog thrust upon him had not contained three black ones, he might have held fast. But, as everybody knows, it is impossible to withstand a black jelly bean for long. Peter began solemnly to inspect one of the black jelly beans, and then to sniff it, and then to taste it, and before he knew it, he was eating it. And while he was doing all this, and wrestling with his conscience, the pollywog was off with his loot and threw the hole in the screen door and away for the Mexican border. He did not get very far, of course. His mother, using that mysterious radar that mothers have, sensed at once that something was wrong. She dropped the phone, darted out the door, plucked up the pollywog by his diapers, kicking and struggling, and bore him back into the house. Then she picked up a whistle and blew it as a signal for Penny to come out of the playhouse. Penny dropped her book and came running obediently across the field. It's Paul again, her mother told her. I can't keep watching him all the time and get anything done. I found him out of the petunias just now. How he got away, I'll never know, but he's been at the candy again. Poor little Polly, Penny said. He just hates being cooped up. He's slept all morning and he's as frisky as a pup, her mother said. I want you and Pamela to look after him for the rest of the afternoon and take Peter with you. He shouldn't be inside on a day like this. He just wants to play with his old cars, said Penny. He's no fun at all. Well, go on out to the playhouse and play dress up, her mother said. Perhaps Peter will be a pirate or something and watch Paul every single minute. Understand, Penny? Yes, said Penny, thinking about Lucy Lawless, who had no little brothers to look after. Every single minute, mind, her mother said. Yes, mother, said Penny, as she plucked the pollywog out of her mother's arms. He came quietly now, for he knew the jig was up. And besides, he liked Penny, who usually made a fuss over him. He grinned from ear to ear as she tickled him and then barked twice like a dog. Earless Osdick, who had been mildly stunned when the pollywog fell on him, heard the bark and patted out obediently. He had been reviving himself on jelly beans and was now ready for anything. Come on, Pete, Penny called. And Peter, who was back on the sofa playing with his tractor, rolled off and trotted after her. I'm in my rocket ship, said Peter. We're leaving for the moon. Don't be so silly, Peter, Penny said crossly. Rrrr, said Peter, zooming his tractor through the air. Landing on the moon. Whoosh, everybody off. What's that black around your lips, Penny asked suspiciously. 
don't know, said Peter in a very low voice, meaning he did know. It's licorice jelly beans, cried Penny. Oh, Peter, you naughty boy, you've been into the jelly beans. Have not, cried Peter, outraged. Polly gave them to me. The Pollywog, hearing his name, barked twice like a dog, opened his fist, and popped the last of the jelly beans into his mouth. Just for that, you're both going to play dress up with us, said Penny triumphantly, for she had been looking for an excuse to rope them into it. Don't want to, said Peter, as they reached the playhouse. He didn't like dress up because he always had to dress up as a lady. Pam, Penny shouted, go get Patsy. We're all going to play dress up and have a tea party. There's no use asking Patsy to come, said Pamela, looking up from her comic book. She's over in the compost heap digging for worms with the twins, and they won't come. Well, we'll just have to make her come, said Penny. She's supposed to help us look after Polly. Besides, we need five if it's going to be any fun. I'll tell Patsy she can't come because she painted the windows, Pamela said. Then she'll want to come, and when she starts screaming, we'll let her. She went off to get Patsy while Penny opened up the treasure chest. Keeping one eye on the polywog, she began to pull out a series of cast-off evening dresses which had once belonged to her mother and to her various aunts. She held up one particularly elegant dress made of faded green satin with a lace bodice. Here, Peter, she said generously, this is for you. Peter took it out without much enthusiasm. Can I still play with my cars? He asked. Oh, Peter, Penny cried. Who ever heard of a genteel and refined lady arriving at a tea party and playing with little cars? Really? Just my little dump truck, Peter said. Oh, all right, said Penny. Across the field, she could hear Patsy start to scream. The scream cut the air and just as suddenly stopped. Soon the door burst open and Patsy rushed in, her pigtails flying and her pet snake, Snavely, poking out of the pocket of her jeans. It's all so jalopy, Patsy shouted. She said I couldn't, but I can. Can't I, Penny? All right, said Penny, remembering Pamela's strategy. Just this once you can stay to tea. The three girls each donned a costume from the treasure chest. I know, Pamela said. Let's pretend this is Pollywog's house and we're all visiting him for tea. Here's a picture of everybody playing dress up. Hmm. He is not happy about his satin dress. Lovely. We'd have to go out and leave him inside alone, said Penny cautiously. It would be for just a minute, said Pamela. See, we pretend it's his bachelor apartment and we all arrive one after another, and knock on the door, and he lets us in, and then we sit down and have tea with him. He can't, said Patsy. He's too little. Penny was thinking. The idea appealed to her, but it would mean leaving Polly alone for a minute, and Mother had said not to take her eyes off him for a single minute. But he'll be perfectly safe, Penny, Pamela said. He can't get out of the playhouse or anything. He'll cry if we close the door on him, said Patsy. Not if we leave Earless Ostick with him, said Pamela. Well, said Penny slowly, I guess nothing could go wrong. Paul's the vice president of the Escapers Club, said Patsy. Well, he can't escape from the playhouse, stupid, Pamela said. Not in one single minute he can't. All right, said Penny, but let's hurry. Everybody dressed? Okay, Polly, you stay here. This is your house, understand? And we're all pretty society ladies coming to tea. 
And you're a bachelor, said Pamela, and this is really your penthouse apartment. We're just going to close the door for a minute, Polly, Penny said. We'll just walk a bit down the path and come back, and you must welcome each of us and offer us tea. Or a martini cocktail, said Patsy. Certainly not, said Penny, shocked. Okay, Polly Wuggums, here, you take Earless Osdick and play with him. We'll be back in a minute. And pushing the others ahead of her, she tiptoed out and closed the door. Once again, the Pollywog found himself in prison with no apparent means of escape. The door was latched and he could not reach the knob. The windows were screened and too high to climb to. The cupboards, which he knew contained little boxes of candy, were also above his reach. Prisoners flung into dungeon cells in ancient times must have felt the same kind of frustration that the Pollywog felt now. And then... Before his eyes, a miracle occurred. A square piece in the floor began to rise very slowly. A small green hand appeared and then an arm. A head with two eyes stared out through the opening. Another dog, the pollywog thought to himself. But the eyes were not looking at the pollywog. They were examining earless Osdick. A second hand appeared, reached out, seized the cat by the nape of the neck, and pulled him down into the blackness. The piece of the floor began to descend back into place again, but the pollywog was quicker than the little green hand. He grabbed the edge of the piece of floor and forced it upward. He shoved his own head into the blackness and then, by dint of squirming, the rest of his body. He could hear a knocking at the door behind him. Suddenly, he tumbled down into something dark, and as he did, he released his grip. The piece of floor snapped back into place, and the playhouse was empty. This time, the pollywog, for better or for worse, had really escaped. There he is, going down into the playhouse floor. <laughs>